All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our October uh, webinar in our SUNY online teaching series. We are um, pleased to have you here with us this afternoon and we're thrilled to have Nikki um, join us again for um, another webinar. Some of you may have been on one with her last month. So uh, Dr. Nikki Child Rose is an associate professor of history, a faculty fellow and founding director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at SUNY Columbia Green Community College. And she is also a SUNY online teaching ambassador. So Nikki, we're happy to have you here and look forward to what you have to share with us today. Thank you so much, Erin, and, and also Alex for having me and everyone for joining today. Um, I am just so honored to be here and talk with everyone about um, you know, this topic that is really rocking our worlds, um, but is something that I'm just so excited to be like collaborating with, with many others in the system with and also in the trenches teaching. Um, in fact, I just came from teaching a U.S. history class. So um, if I could just uh, ask everybody to please post in the chat, um, you know, where uh, where you're from and sort of, you know, what your role is, that would be really helpful. I'm hoping to make this session as interactive um, as an opportunity as we could to connect and sort through this uh, AI and assessment, getting beyond the basics this afternoon. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, and the first thing I always like to just share and put out there is the fact that I am not an AI expert by any means. Uh, those are my computer science colleagues and certainly not me, but I am an early adopter of teaching with technology. And it's something that excites me because I feel like it can enhance my teaching, but certainly not replace great teaching. So today, what I'm hoping to kind of dive into with, with you all is exploring together how AI can really support more inclusive assessment practices that could be adapted for any variety of disciplines. So I will share that I teach history and political science mainly. Um, I teach in the general education courses and area but I work with, in my role as the director of our newly launched Center for Innovation, Teaching and Learning, instructors from all disciplines um, and also from all seasons of their careers. So uh, everyone from new adjunct instructors that we're onboarding to you know, really seasoned educators. And understanding how theory, in particular adult learning theory, principles apply to assessments that are enhanced through AI. And again, I'm always really framing this in the sense that AI or any technology is never a replacement for great teaching and great learning, but it's an enhancement. It's a tool like any other technology tool to leverage in our toolbox. Uh, we are going to have an opportunity during this session to hopefully develop an action plan that you could utilize in your teams as we also share some practical approaches for integrating AI with our current practices. I feel like anytime I'm attending professional learnings, it's really great to be able to go back with some sort of action plan. Um, so I've sort of developed a template that I will share and you can modify in your work with your teams, either at a program or division level, um, or just with colleagues that are teaching the same courses as you, or even just in your own course. The other thing that I always uh, hope to emphasize and, and would recommend to any educator is to always just be clear and transparent and fair and really maintaining our human touch in any of the innovative uh, educational work that we do. I'm really of the mind that empathy, creativity, mentorship, our individual expertise, our experiences can really never be replaced. And, and that's actually where uh, the jumping off point of today's presentation will be. So I'm excited and thank you so much um, for posting in the chat a little bit more about you. 
Today's presentation goes beyond the basics, and yet I want to start with the basics because um, I think that sharing more about AI, how the technology works, what options even exist out there is a great way for, for each of us to level up as educators, as pedagogy experts, as perhaps instructional designers joining us. Um, and also administrators. So um, as we do that, though, I always actually like to ask my own students this question and colleagues, will the robots replace us? So I'd like to invite everyone in the chat to weigh in on this. What do you think? Do you think that, I mean, we're living in a fourth industrial revolution and beyond. We're living in a globalized plus era so what's going to happen in education do you think do you think they're out for our jobs as you weigh in on that i love to hear reflections um i'm going to i'm going to say no not so much not so fast robots and it's actually kind of a burning question among a lot of my students um they're entering so they're taking history classes often because it's a pathway toward their career, whether they're going into health sciences or other technical professions, um, perhaps hospitality and tourism, education. And they're wondering, like, what will happen to the jobs that I'm planning for, my career? And they really like to actually talk about AI in that, in that frame. So, we, through our discussions, kind of say, not so fast robots, and here's why. Let me share a little bit more about AI, and I think demystifying it is really important in the work that you do with your teams, with your students. AI is a branch of science and technology devoted to the creation of machines. This is perhaps review for, for so many of you, but I think it's really important to start here because knowing what it is also tells us what it is not. So this can encompass automation, robotics, software, everything from our self-driving cars, uh, how we're purchasing things, how we interact with tools in our homes. Just the other day, I had a student share with me, not this exact photo, but a, 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 another one from their grocery store experience. They took a picture of a robot in the meat department, and I just thought that was so interesting. <laughs> so AI is simulating human intelligence processes by and in our computer systems. Things like understanding, reasoning, learning, problem solving, even more effective communication are all realms where AI is touching and encompassing. So I would like to invite everyone in the chat to just share how AI is um, interacting in your daily life. Like what are some of the applications that come to mind uh, whether you're in the grocery store or ordering something from home or accessing healthcare for some ideas, uh, let's post in the chat where outside of education, we are interacting with AI in everyday life. And I see people are joining in. So if you're just joining in, I'll, I'll invite everyone to just uh, post a bit about you in the chat and also on this question, where are we interacting with AI in our daily lives? Um, used it yesterday to fix a furnace, the Roomba. Oh, this is great. I'm loving this. <laughs> there are definitely some things where I'm like, come on, robots, I need you. And then other things where it's just like, hmm, I'm not sure about this. Am I living in a dystopia <laughs> or, or can this be great? I encourage you to um, have these discussions again with your students uh, in an online discussion space, you know, because today I'm going to challenge all of us to think about how we can enhance teaching and learning, enhance particularly our assessments by asking students to bring their everyday experiences into our courses, into the learning. That's exactly what adult learning theory empowers us to do. And it really works so well 
with this dynamic and evolving um, topic. So don't worry. I don't think that AI is going to replace us anytime soon, but I think that uh, it could be a powerful tool to enhance our work. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, as we dig a little beyond the basics, I want to just talk a little bit about some of these technical applications that you're mentioning, image processing, speech recognition, video processing, natural language processing, sentiment analysis is like where AI can sort of detect a tone of writing and um, sharing some of these things because they may be ideas or jumping off points for you to think about actually drilling down to your assessments, ways that you could leverage these technical applications. The Internet of Things, I think about, um, I was the former chair of our technical professions division at Columbia Green, and I was often thinking about our automotive technology uh, courses and, uh, you know, how instructors can really put forward in learning outcomes, you know, how a whole car system um, relates to an, and is, in a way, an internet of things. Those are the things all around us that AI is enhancing in our world. And clearly showing students and telling them that that's what they're learning is in itself a way to infuse AI in our courses. Just communicating those outcomes is a piece of this. AI systems work through data analysis, learning from patterns, um, just like in the world of institutional effectiveness and higher ed assessment. It's taking big data sets often and learning from that and using algorithms to learn and make decisions from there. This is important to recognize as educators because there's some limitations to this that we ought to have sort of top of mind. The more data they're given and the more patterns they learn, the better they become at performing tasks that we're asking them to do. So why this is sort of like suddenly shaking things up because AI is, is really not new um, is a lot of these things listed. It's about the um, sort of making of a lot of the tools more available to uh, general audiences, educators alike. It's advances in AI research, sort of the deep learning. And of course, a lot of this is happening if you follow the news at uh, research universities, some of our own. So that's exciting. Just the growth of the internet, social media, other digital technologies is all accumulating these data sets, um, which are then training AI models. So I think it's so important, again, for, for each of us as educators to sort of put on our own oxygen before we, we uh, fly this plane and uh, infuse it or enhance our courses. So machine learning, robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, and systems are all, you know, potential areas depending on your programs, your courses um, that you may really want to be following with AI. I am mostly for this presentation going to focus on what I'm using most and, and what I'm working with colleagues using generative AI. So it's a type of AI that focuses on creating new content. So something like ChatGPT or Perplexity um, are among these tools. And you can certainly purchase uh, applications like a ChatGPT version for your teams, for education that are a little bit safer and um, a little bit better set up for educational settings. So I just wanted to sort of show um, this slide that outlines or sort of frames generative AI use cases in some of our common disciplines, whether it's healthcare, um, business and economics, content creation, um, or in communication as, as the bottom piece. So this kind of um, framework, I think, is helpful for students who are 
who were preparing to go into any of these sectors. Generative AI is not limited to these but I, I find it really helpful to help students visualize this because when we're looking at our learning outcomes and our assessments, we may really wanna think about uh, how we're best preparing them for their careers and in life and all of those things. Another area that we'll sort of uh, dip our toe into is conversational AI, um, which is the natural language processing, um, as well. And a lot of these tools are also, as I'll speak to, embedded in integrations that we use or study aids um, or even our digital learning environments. So just the way that natural language processing works is um, comprehending what's being said and then inputting that information and generating responses. So this is like chat bots that, that may be used. So breaking this all down or funneling it into education specific for our purposes, um, some of the big, the big movements are in personalized learning, the development or use of study aids um, from a different perspective, uh, plagiarism detection, academic honesty tools, things like Turnitin, learning management and our DLEs, so like a Brightspace or a Canvas, writing tools and assessment tools, and also gamification. One of my favorite tools is iCivics, which actually puts students on a personalized gaming path. I use that mostly for review or enhancement of a lesson in a political science course. Other categories are um, tutoring systems, exploratory learning, automated writing evaluation, like something like Grammarly, AI supported reading and language, and uh, VR or AR tools, which are really great. Like in uh, arts and humanities, like in history, I can send students to a place in the world or go back in time and simulate what it would have been like to you know, set up a civilization in any part of the world or something like that. That can be really powerful learning. Overall, I think the challenge is in how do we navigate this maze of maintaining rigor and academic integrity in our courses and also implement effective, dynamic, and engaging assessments that are also fair and inclusive we know that there are major digital equity gaps, so we want to always have that in mind, but still leverage these tools. And so to address these challenges, I really like to turn to the basics of adult learning theory, which I'll just share sort of how it grounds um, a lot of this practice, I feel, in a positive way. Knowing that adult learners are self-directed um, and uh, taking problem-centered approaches about real-world applied learning, um, knowing that our learners bring, especially in online courses, so much of their personal experiences that we can then uh, really have a one-to-one -one experience and bring back to the group knowing that for the most part, there's a motivation factor, there's a curiosity factor. There may be on the flip side, like a little bit of fear and uncertainty, a confidence factor. But I think we can bridge that gap by making our courses so relevant and applied um, so that they can directly take what they're learning and use it in their careers and their work and their lives. So that is how for me anyway, adult learning grounds teaching, but also preparation, uh, anything from course design, best practices to when I'm sitting down with a faculty member and just talking about perhaps looking at learning outcomes and infusing these in courses, these kind of things um, really make sense, I think, for any committed educator to infuse and enhance their courses. So, um, I also want to keep in mind, though, that it, it goes a little bit deeper 
Um, the theory is important, but I, I've also spent a long time, a couple of years, really immersed in digital equity. And we have to really take into, into consideration how all of the things like race and gender and socioeconomics and differing abilities interact with how our students experience AI in our educational settings. This is where I think it's really helpful and important to use systems thinking as we consider access, bias in AI, um, personalization over standardizing, and I mean, I guess my hope transformationally would be, uh, you know, better representation in AI development. So uh, that that would be certainly a long term goal. So we really want to think about in assessment space, how well do all students obtain outcomes? You know, how equitable are our outcomes? And uh, again, how could we leverage AI to promote that? So that's where universal design is so helpful. And a few weeks ago, I was really talking a lot about this to the DEI collaborative, about removing barriers, providing those equitable opportunities, and recognizing that there really is no typical student that we uh, really have to take that into consideration with design and delivery of our courses. Um, back in the fall of 2023, uh, we had a really well attended, excellent panel discussion with AI experts unlike myself, where we explored some SUNY resources and communities of practice related to AI, discussed from each of their perspective strategies, and uh, really then kind of launched uh, our first discussions on um, using AI in assessment. So I want to just shout out for that, and we can make uh, that recording I know is out there and available. But what we came up with is the power of systems thinking from the classroom to equity lens to our assessments and um, how important that is. So overall, as we're thinking about these things, there's really three categories uh, in a spectrum that can help us understand sort of where we or our teams stand as we adopt AI. So the first, and, and we're going to use these in our action planning today. So um, as you're multitasking, pay attention to these next three points. The first sort of place on this spectrum is where AI tools are not permitted for students or very limited. So, you know, with concerns over testing and exams, sometimes it would be inappropriate to permit any AI use or enhancements, labs or applied learning that we want to happen in sort of a real time or, you know, no use of AI and also in discussion-based or reflection-based assignments. And that is okay to not permit AI tools. The second is where AI tools can be used in an assistive role as drafting and structuring content, exam practice, giving feedback as a support. Um, any of these things would, would sort of be the second category. And thirdly, where AI has an integral role. And this can be anything from creation of work, code development, translation of content, reframing, analyzing content, having a student actually debate with AI, like it would be integral to that activity. There's overall, outside of, in addition to those three sort of camps, a whole spectrum of teaching with AI. So you could use this to assess your own practice, again, that of a department, all the way from low adoption and low ethical consideration where nothing changes and AI is just avoided. Unfortunately, that could perhaps not fully prepare students for that world of work, as we saw where they're encountering AI or in our lives where we're interacting, as you said, all the time from our homes to beyond, all the way up the spectrum 
to really where there's a high adoption and a high ethical consideration. Not only are we using it, but we're constantly evaluating the tool where learning and results improve, faculty are using it to encourage critical thinking. That's where the magic of the robots will never replace us. And the student journey involves thinking responsibly, thinking ethically, and benefiting from the tool. So all points on this spectrum exist and are okay. Um, but I think it's kind of helpful to have a tool and a spectrum to know where we stand. So this is where um, I want to think about what we've just talked about and develop an action plan. So I'm just going to check in with Aaron to see if we could break out for about eight minutes to okay. do a little bit of action planning. Do that. Excellent. So I'm going to stop this share and um, share a template that I would like for us to use in these discussions. So I'm just going to screen share. And I've just sort of prepared four questions for our small groups. And you could, we will share this as a tool that you can use with, again, your colleagues, your, your departments. Um, on where we fall on the scale and, and why, and then what policies currently exist around AI and, and how these could be perhaps improved over time, any learning outcomes uh, that could be enhanced and what assessments in our courses could perhaps be enhanced. This is a little bit of brainstorming. And then when we come back from this, I'm gonna share slides that have content all about this, if that sounds like a plan. You got it, okay. Uh, sending folks to breakout rooms. There's the uh, document and we can leave this up on the screen. Aaron, which one do I go to? I did not assign the host, Alex, but I am okay. able to move you. Do you want to go to a room? Yeah, you can put me in a room. Okay, let me find one that's not full.
if folks are in the main room, you can jump into a breakout group. Um, you have to accept to join. And if you're just coming in, we are spending a few minutes in breakout groups discussing uh, what we've just talked about in part in the presentation. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to post in the chat. If you are joining in or in your in the main session, we invite you to join a breakout room. That's what we're doing right now. And we'll be coming back as a whole group shortly. If you're not in a group, we have some questions on screen for reflection. I'm thinking, Aaron, if we can pull people back in a couple minutes, that will be good. Sure, no problem. Let me give it like another two minutes. Yeah. going to pull slides back up. We've got about one more minute. Okay, I'll close the breakout room. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. There's oh. never never a smooth way to pull everybody back from a breakout. <laughs> just isn't one at a time <laughs> <laughs> but I hope your conversations went well and Aaron you can give me a green light when most of us are back yeah. we're, we're back gonna automatically close in about 10 seconds anyway okay yeah I'm trying to not watch everything <laughs> <laughs> Head to the light, Rich said. <laughs> okay, Nikki, you're all set. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for taking some time to connect with others. Even if you only got to like question one and two, again, I, I really just want to encourage everyone to take these ideas back with your teams. Um, I'd be curious to hear in the chat any of the the consensus that came out of, or, um, you know, maybe uh, any of the positions that sort of came out when it comes to policy making and, and as you post insights from the breakouts, I'd love to just share some sample policy and principles, which are probably um, being updated all the time. Uh, it's not too hard to do a search and find just some some broad policy, but I think making it custom to your specific institutional goals and mission, academic philosophies, and then down to the department and the course level is helpful. Um, here you have a college aligning itself to five principles that are being adopted across SUNY to ensure assessments remain robust, fair, and continue to prepare students for future workplace or transfer in the case of our community college. It's as important for us to look at what the four-year institutions are doing to, to then update our policies. Um, so these are some ideas, again, that I will share. When it comes to communicating directly with students also, being clear about which type of course this is going to be, especially with generative AI. Is this a course or an assessment where it's not permitted, it's permitted as an assistive tool or has an integral role? 90% of the cases that come to me are instructors using Turnitin or adopting Turnitin to check papers for generative AI use. But that's a great opportunity for me to discuss with that instructor um, what's been communicated to students, how it could potentially be used as a teachable moment, and then for the future to be proactive about um, leveraging AI or just being clear that it's not permitted in that case. Um, sort of the next step on, on the action planning is looking at our learning outcomes for a course. It's always important to begin with that end in mind, and uh, we will share a link to how anyone can access this enhanced Bloom's Taxonomy Revisited, thanks to Oregon State University. This is also being updated regularly with um, just taking basic Blooms and then enhancing it with AI capabilities all the way from the base level to a more synthesis creation level. When looking at a course learning outcome or program learning outcomes, I think taking this new taxonomy into consideration is really helpful. Looking at what are we actually preparing or asking students to do and leave this experience with. Very helpful tool. Honestly, feel like I walk around with this, giving it out to people all the time. Um, and it's very, very helpful. When considering uh, our assessments or our learning outcomes, thinking about just how will this assignment help students from various backgrounds um, really enhance their critical thinking? Uh, how will they come to this activity or assignment uh, from each of their perspectives? How can we use these particular tools for someone who has less literacy with them, less familiarity. Maybe it's a student's first time trying out perplexity or some other tool. Maybe it's their first time experiencing um, something that you're setting up in a digital learning environment. 
being inclusive about how you approach that uh, will really matter to them. Uh, I have some examples of just really basic using um, like chat GPT to revise learning outcomes. It can be really time consuming to invent learning outcomes and with instructors, um, some of the things that I'll just say as far as tips are to be as specific as possible in instructions, review outcomes with colleagues. Like, I don't think that what is generated at first should ever be like the end. Revise them often and make sure that they're mapping to uh, institutional learning outcomes and program learning outcomes. Um, Another step of this action planning drills down into further into the weeds of designing actual assessments within a course. So I feel like once your policies are there and developing and transparent to students, and then you're looking at your learning outcomes, then it goes down into the actual activities themselves in which you can use AI to brainstorm, to customize, to adapt. Um, generative AI allows us to adjust parameters like length of our prompt, be more succinct in these directions. That in itself can be so helpful when we're busy, we're teaching multiple classes, and we're trying to think more inclusively. I have just a sample here of where um, an instructor prompted a generative AI tool to design an inclusive assessment for fill in the blank of any class, which covers fill in the blank for whatever topic they're looking at. This assessment should consider diverse backgrounds and learning styles of students and include the following elements. So there were seven things that this instructor wanted to make sure they were hitting on in the development of this assessment. It would be interesting. So this is like very specific. Um, and that's what prompt engineering is about. So you can work with faculty, practice yourself um, to, to really get into specific prompt engineering, which is then going to educate the AI tool. Um, so here's just sort of an example of taking an activity, a community action project, for example, and using generative AI to develop that out a bit. Make sure to be specific, align with your course learning outcomes, and revise. Don't let this be the end all. Um, I actually also, if I am ever using this as a tool, I will cite it just to model for students, like, where did this come up with? Uh, where did I come up with this? And, and then again, modeling that practice. There's so many issues, though, and limitations to some of the generative AI tools. For example, currency. Confirmation bias can be an issue. Um, so just always having the limitations in mind, I think is, is very important. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through some of these other examples um, to just in the sake of time, and, and we'll, I'll share all the examples in the resources that we share after this presentation. But I really wanted to just share some of the things that I'm excited about that we're doing at Columbia Green as we've launched our Center for Innovation, Teaching and Learning. Um, a high traffic tool and resource is a library guide that we developed uh, myself and three faculty fellows with our library team, um, which is accessible also beyond the institution to our community. Uh, we have a tab in our LibGuide on AI for educators and AI for students. And it's really helpful because we can assess like how many people are accessing this. We can easily use it um, to when we're working with other faculty and also just direct students to it. So here's just a look in at our uh, faculty and staff and admin tab but then we have a tab that we're building out for students. So they can just try um, some of these tools. They can watch some quick videos and start to gain a literacy um, uh, of some of the AI resources. I also really wanna share um, this excellent, I am a proud member of SUNY FACT2. 
who's developed and has working groups working on developing guides and tools to optimize AI in higher ed. So there is a link to um, also access that. And this is the link to our panel discussion going back to last November on navigating assessment in the digital era. And um, I do want to leave time for some conversation questions, results of our breakout action planning, and happy to pull slides back up, but just a little connecting time with each of us. So if we can open it up, happy to talk. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. And while you're doing that, feel free anyone to unmute yourself or type in the chat. I'm going to be putting in two links for you so that you can access uh, the materials and the recording. Um, it, it takes about a day or so for us to get that up. So I'm just, as I'm scanning the chat, you know, I'm seeing a lot of like non-consensus regarding AI um, and, and that is, that relates to my experiences. Um, I'm looking at Maureen Larson's post in the chat. Students are encouraged to use those, but told they cannot use AI. It's difficult to determine what's okay and how to use it. So yeah, that's, that speaks to the sort of muddy waters and that maze I think that's the whole goal of when infusing it in active, robust, like dynamic and engaging assessment, you're also teaching AI literacy and you're teaching boundaries, you're modeling those um, and, and not avoiding it. So thanks, Maureen. Hi, Nikki. Um, let me just turn my video on. Sorry. <laughs> this is Morella Fiaco um, from SUNY Canton. I have a question for you. How do you, you provided great resources, excellent presentation. I'm so glad that um, some of my faculty and I are here today. Um, what are some of the ways, because there's quite a lot of resistance. We are on our campus working on some policies and integrating it into our um, you know, handbook for academic honesty and, you know, those types of things. So as you navigate this, how do you get faculty buy-in? How do you go about training? How do you, you know, um, where, where, where do you start? What do, what are your recommendations? You know, where do we go from here? Clearly some of us are petrified and then others, <laughs> you know, use it and embrace it. And so how, how do we meet in the middle and how do we, you know, how do you go about it? Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, and for being here with, with your team. And, and asking those hard questions is where you start, you know, <laughs> and bringing the team. Um, the SUNY resources I found so helpful as a starting place. We have sort of a, a repository of, of a place on our internet where we can at least post things and start to just put information out there. I think... Um, finding allies in the various academic areas uh, to who are using this, who are trying this, whether they love it or not, like doesn't matter as long as they're they're somewhat using it and somewhat have a literacy in these tools um, in the various areas, putting together your systems, your networks, and starting those conversations from a discipline specific avenue because, you know, the computer science department's going to have very different concerns from our health sciences teams. All of those perspectives, I would highly value. And on that spectrum, there's good reasons for adopting or not adopting, as long as we're very clear to students why, <laughs> without just avoiding it. That is not ideal because, as you noted, all of you it's in our lives, like the ship has already sailed. So, so um, we would not be, you know, doing our duty by just avoiding it. 
it's like any other technology and it's it's really not new. It's just that the ways in which we're using it and the availability. So demystifying, taking some of the fear out, but also being the critical thinkers. I mean, there's a reason why in higher ed, we are skeptical <laughs> because we're thinking critically. Um, so there are issues and all of those things. We have some champions on our campus of, you know, faculty, um, in different disciplines who are, are hosting some learning lounges, some talks, some discussions, and we're gathering those resources and we're making them available. And that has been helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and someone... Uh, noted that without clear definitions of what counts as AI, it's impossible to have good AI policy. Um, we have to be very AI literate to develop good, effective policy. Um, so that's where we really need expertise and non-avoidance because uh, the policy will rest on that. So agreed. The action planning document, I know it's only a few questions, but that can be a good um, tool or artifact to bring back to your departments and your teams, whether they're more administrator or faculty teams. Um, and you can modify that with questions that are coming up more relevant to your campuses. But I like having at least a tool or a framework as a jumping off point for those discussions. So we might have time for one more question or anything that popped out of the chat that I missed. I'm happy to address. And then I promised I'd turn it back over to Aaron in the last minute or so. <laughs> and in the slides that I will share, um, there's some examples of the things that I discussed with gamification, which is kind of a great and safe way to try AI in your courses as like a formative assessment tool. So it's not high stakes and it can just enhance, you know, the experience. iCivics is one of my favorites. Thank you, David, uh, for sharing. You're, you're, you're welcome, um, Nikki. I put um, last year the uh, the faculty in the Creativity and Change of Leadership Department here at SUNY Buffalo State, Okay, we developed um, a series of guidelines for how students uh, can and or should use AI on uh, five different types of assignments, like presentations, papers, training, others, that sort of thing. Um, and so the folder that I shared, which anybody in here is welcome to use, ignore, modify, however you would like, you'll see in there um, a series of guidelines that we give our students at the beginning of a course. Um, and then when they submit an assignment now, they submit whatever appropriate checklist uh, that accompanies the guidelines. All right. So if it's a, if if they look at the guidelines for um, using AI to help write a paper, then when they submit their paper, they they submit the checklist. And it's we've been using it now for about a year, and it it works pretty effectively for us. We learn ourselves then when we look over the checklist how these students are using it, uh, you know, using you know, using AI tools. So. That's that's excellent. That's also really good, um, David, metacognition, because then they're thinking about how they're coming up with with an end result. And that's just great practice. Anyhow, I love that. Um, and it feels so good to have a checklist. And, and it's also sounds like you're doing like amazing scholarship of teaching and learning, learning about it as we're, you know, uh, proceeding and instructing students. Every time I teach, I learn. So, <laughs> mm. yeah, we, we very much believe our students are going into an AI world. 
So we owe it to them, we feel, to show them how to use it ethically, creatively, responsibly. But if you look at the guidelines and checklists, you'll know that there's a whole column in each one of them for the human part. We keep reminding them, you know, not to outsource their thinking, but to use, you know, use these tools uh, to, to uh, help them. That's so helpful. I also shared um, after the treasure David shared a the fact two link to the guide that I shared. In addition, um, Turnitin offers some tools to help administrators with the policy piece. Um, going back to like our first question that came up, and uh, there's not only resources for administrators but also faculty and students. So. Thank you, Carrie. Shout outs to librarians. Um, the digital resource guide has been essential for our work. Uh, totally agree, Carrie. Librarians are amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone. I'm gonna kick it back to Erin. Yeah, thank you. I think Carrie's statement's a great one to, to close on. So. Um, I appreciate you, Nikki, as always. I appreciate you sharing your expertise. Oh, my dog is saying hello. <laughs> I posted some uh, links in the chat for you. And here is a preview of our next um, session. It will be November 6th. And again, we're talking about an assessment. We will be joined by Judy Littletown from Genesee Community College and John Kane from Oswego for that one. So we hope to see you all there at our next event. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Take care.